and I am a second year's master's student um, at the College of Global Public Health. And I went to Nairobi, Kenya um, with HealthRight to work um, with members of the Refugee Coalition of East Africa. I went to Nairobi to kind of, basic, basically the Refugee Coalition is a really small organization. And um, the, the main goals really that my project was, was primarily kind of like community organizing and capacity strengthening of the organization, which I'll talk about in, in just a moment, um, to, to develop and kind of like brainstorm what, how we can do very lightweight mental health programming um, and social support, and then also work on livelihood projects for, um, for a lot of reasons. Many of the people can't work. And so how can we generate money for them? So the Refugee Coalition of East Africa is two years old, and it was developed by LGBT refugees in Kenya who had come from other countries and who, who went to Kenya. And it's really one of the only refugee-led organizations for LGBT refugees um, in East Africa. It certainly is in East Africa, but it's one of the very few in the world. Um, their main goals, they have, they have four main goals, which is advocacy and kind of like realizing the power of, of many in, as opposed to just like individual voices. It's kind of like uniting on a voice. Strategic planning on how um, the, the community can, can move forward and to do long-term goals. Fundraising, um, fiscal hosting, because it is a coalition, it's a bunch of little tiny organizations, and a lot of them don't have the capacity for a bank account. Um, a lot of them do not have the ability to do necessarily grant writing and stuff like that. So we're, the coalition acts as kind of a, an umbrella organization that can kind of act as an authority to hold, to allow these little organizations to apply for you know, tiny grants and to hold that money in a bank account. Um, and then also um, research, whether it's, and it's really trying to um, provide a vehicle for international researchers to gain entry into the community and have what research does happen be led and in participation with community members. So it's very kind of a, a vehicle for community-based participatory research, which is really um, great, which is kind of in a way how I've, I've entered it. Um, but I've ended up becoming very close with a lot of the members. And one thing to kind of understand here um, about this is that these are, this is a group of, of people who are generally incredibly poor, um, who are often gender divergent. They're, they're, they're not necessarily male or female or um, maybe, you know, um, th they're, they're a target just by existing. And um, a lot of them are under the age of 24 years old. A lot of them have not completed, you know, what we would consider basically primary school and stuff like that. So in, in one sense, to ask a group of people to organize yourself and write a grant and fund yourself for people who don't have basic competency in, a, in English is kind of impossible. But there's a greater context too, and it's you know about sexuality and gender in East Africa. Um, a lot of people probably know about the, um, the anti-homosexuality bill that Uganda had in 2014, which kind of really started a lot of this migration, people fleeing Uganda um, to, to Kenya, which for, for a lot of reasons has become the, the destination. And one of the main reasons that they have ha, has a de destination is that UNHCR, which is in Kenya, already had a very big footprint. Um, at the time, one of the largest refugee camps in the world was in Kakuma. Um, and UNHCR in Kenya did a really unique thing, is that they said um, gender and sexuality can be a basis for your asylum claims. And so um, that brought about 
I would I would say over a period of, of four or five years, um, uh, maybe twelve hundred people um, fleeing to Kenya for this reason. And then two really interesting incidents also kind of happened recently that kind of can frame this. One in March of 2019. Yes, March of 2019 was the um, Dunsit two terrorist attacks that happened in Nairobi. And these were attacks that were eventually found out to be refugees that were in from the, one of the refugee camps that attacked one of the hotels in Nairobi. And the other one is Section 182 and 185. Um, which are the criminal code, it's uh, colonial codes that basically um, outlawed homosexuality. And it was in the Supreme Court um, attempting to be overturned. And there was a lot of belief in the community that these would be overturned. And on um, May 24th is when the decision was supposed to be handed, handed down, which is also the day that I arrived in Kenya. And it was not, it was upheld. So there was a lot of despair and deflation in the community, and it was really kind of um, it was quite a moment to be there, certainly. But this is an interesting project because it's really kind of the intersection of migration and sexuality, yet it doesn't really fit within either group. Um, if you ask the LGBT community of Kenyans about the, the LGBT refugees, they're like, they're Ugandans, they're, they're not Kenyan, so they're not a part of our community. But if you ask the migrant groups, the refugee groups about the LGBT refugees, they're like, no, they're gay, they're not a part of our group. So it's really this tiny group of people that is very, very isolated and very, very alone. A perfect example of this is what we call the, we're calling the Great Lakes Incident. Um, it's 76 refugees that were living in four tiny little rooms in one of the slums and we we discovered them when we were doing site visits to um to all the different refugee groups and we came up i mean we were shocked when we walked into this environment and there are you know 25 people in each room and it's a tiny tiny room and it's just like they're help us we're being attacked some of the trans members um had been in the rooms like could not leave the rooms for for several weeks because as soon as they walked outside they would be attacked and so they were like we need to get out of here we can't we we have no way you know and and you could you could see the tension rising from the surrounding um from the surrounding homes and even while we were we were talking with this group the tribal chief came and said they they gave us an eviction notice and said these people have to be out tomorrow and we're like, there's no way they can be out tomorrow. But we worked really, really um, hard to raise some money to evacuate them. And we, we were able to get a couple extra days. We worked with UNHCR, who helped us to provide some transportation and all that kind of stuff. Well, through a comedy of errors, almost, um, one of the people that was trying to go get a house for us, um, they were arrested because they were refugee and they had a whole bunch of cash on them. So that house we didn't get. And then another house that we got for them, they were immediately kicked out because um, they were not Kenyan. And then they all kind of ended up in one house. And as soon as we realized that, we're like, okay, we have to distribute them out in the community. And um, it was quite shocking because we were detained there in this house for um, for four days. And I had the, uh, it was difficult for me because I had the ability to leave, kind of, but in a way I also couldn't leave. Um, you know, I was calling the embassy and the embassy was trying to figure out what the situation was, um, and we were in a, tiny house, a three bedroom house, and there's 76 people. And it really turned on me to kind of be the glue to, okay, how can we get money to buy these people food? How can we get water? And, um, and there were even times where the press would be coming and the security guard that was, was detaining us. They're like, you need to move, you need to hide back here. And he would throw a blanket over me 
because the press would come by and they would put a ladder up and they would be like trying to film us and to put us on the news. So it ended up being really, really bad. Our executive director ended up becoming, a, was arrested and he was put in jail for human trafficking. And, um, and then began a very targeted campaign by the government to, um, because they were very scared of this refugee organizing. And they closed our bank account, they revoked our charter, so we were no longer an organization. And it's really been a process of trying to rebuild that. Um, this is a reflection on my positionality. I'm a white guy, why am I here? Um, there were LGBT groups saying, why are you doing this? Go back to your own place. And I'm like, okay, then do something about it. And then they're like, no, we don't want to do it. So what do you do? So look at that really quick, I have to wrap up. And um, we got a new leadership team. We did get some funding. We had joy in all of this, believe it or not. And um, it was really great, but very scary. Thank you.